As we come to this, our last session in the apologetics series of the conference, we want to look particularly at specific examples of how to defend the faith, and I would like for you to turn in your Bibles then this morning to Acts, the 17th chapter, where, we're, where we will read an account of the Apostle Paul specifically defending the Christian faith in the presence of the Greek philosophers of his day. Acts chapter 17, and we'll begin the reading at the 16th verse. Just so you understand the setting, Paul has come to Athens. He's on his way to Corinth eventually, but he's waiting there in Athens for his uh, missionary colleagues to uh, meet up with him. And Athens, you must remember, was the center of philosophy in the ancient world. The Greek philosophers were well known around the world. Philosophy had its beginning, if, if you read any textbook in philosophy, there in Greece. And so now Paul is in the capital, the philosophical capital of the ancient world, and this is what we read. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he beheld the city full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with them that met him. And certain also of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what would this babbler say? Others, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him unto the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which is spoken by you. For you bring certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers sojourning there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. And Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Ye men of Athens, in all things I perceive that you are very superstitious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, that I set forth unto you. The God that made the world and all things therein, he being Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is he served by men's hands as though he needs anything, seeing he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. And he made of one every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed seasons and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek after God, if aptly they might feel after him and find him, although he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain even of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and device of man. The times of ignorance, therefore, God overlooked, but now he commands men that they should all everywhere repent, inasmuch as he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, and that he has raised him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear thee concerning this yet again. Thus Paul went out from among them. But certain men clave unto him and believed, among whom also was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And thus far the reading of God's word. Here we have in the New Testament the most extensive and clear and explicit encounter between the mindset of God's people, the mindset that is given by God's word, the mindset of the Christian, and the mindset of the world in its most sophisticated form, 
in its highest expression of philosophical technicality in Athens. We read that Paul was waiting for his colleagues and while he was in Athens, he couldn't help but be provoked because he looked around and he saw idolatry everywhere. And as you go off to college, you'll be like the Apostle Paul in that respect. You're going to see idolatry everywhere, not because you're going to have people in your college dorm room that are bowing down to idols of wood and stone, but you're going to find people living for some kind of ultimate principle or pleasure that is quite contrary to Jehovah, the Lord of heaven and earth. You're going to see people that respect in their thinking a higher authority than God speaking in his word. You're going to find people who do not respect the Lord Jesus Christ. They live unto themselves and they live for some other ultimate commitment than to serve him. You'll see idolatry in its many forms. You'll see probably expressions of the occult when you go to college. You're going to see expressions of hedonism when you go to college, and existentialism, and materialism, and on and on and on. And so here we have Paul, like you going to college, being provoked by the idolatry all about him. And the Bible says, so he reasoned in the synagogue and in the marketplace every day. Please make note of that. Paul didn't simply proclaim his point of view and tell everybody they have to believe it on his say-so. He reasoned with them. He argued with them. He presented evidence for his position. He dealt with what they believed and why it was wrong and what he believed and why it was right. He reasoned with them every day. And then verse 18 tells us certain of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. That is to say the two schools of Greek philosophy which were prevalent in that day, had representatives there in the marketplace who apparently came across Paul, and they wanted to hear more of what he had to say. They didn't respect Paul, however. They didn't want to hear more from him because they thought he had some truth to bring. They wanted to hear from him because they wanted to ridicule him all the more. And we know that because we find that they said among themselves, what would this babbler say. The word babbler is not the best translation. Technically in Greek it is what is this seed picker saying? A seed picker was a reference to a gutter sparrow. Not a very pleasant image, just a small bird that feeds itself um, from the gutter. And the gutter here is not the nice polite gutters of America. It was the latrine in ancient Athens. And so they're likening Paul to this gutter sparrow. What is this this babbler, this seed picker, all about. He seems to be setting forth different gods. They so misunderstood what Paul was telling them that they thought Paul was setting forth two gods, one named Jesus, one named Resurrection. And so they took hold of him and brought him before the Areopagus. The Areopagus, uh, which is the Greek version of Mars Hill, the hill of Ares or Mars, the Areopagus got its name from that hill where the council originally met. I don't believe in Paul's day that the Areopagus held its sessions actually on the hill, the Areopagus, but it, was, it continued to be called that. Paul later on goes out from among them, so the Areopagus here seems to refer to the council itself and not just the location that he's standing. And he's brought before the Areopagus, which had as its specific purpose in Athens to examine new teachers and to find whether what they're saying is acceptable or not. Way back when, Socrates was tried in Athens for setting forth new gods. And so you know that the city of Athens had that reputation. Luke comments it also had the reputation for de uh, a desire to hear any new thing. And uh, I think about our own world today, how much uh, we're like that too. You know, the TV has just um, satiated us. You know, that's why programs like Donahue and uh, Geraldo and so forth are able to continue the way they do because people are looking for something new, something exciting, something strange, something out of the ordinary. And so we're very much like the Athenians, too. They always wanted to hear some new things. So Paul, what an entertaining fellow, this seed picker. Let's set him before the council and see how well he does in defending this faith of his.
And Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, and this is the way he defended his faith. He first of all pointed out that all men are religious by nature, and yet they have perverted that religion. He uses a word here that it's hard to translate in the English because you either say superstitious, which makes it sound like they don't have any kind of piety or devotion about them, or you say you're very religious, which makes it sound too good. The Greek word is really somewhere in between. What he's saying is you have a religious nature, but it really is kind of a, a silly, uh, stupid is too strong, but it's a perverted religious nature. You, you are very superstitious men. And I know this because as I was passing along, I saw all these altars, and you even have an altar to an unknown god. Now we know from um, archaeology and ancient history that the Athenians had a number of altars like this. Apparently at one point there was a plague in Athens and one of the gurus of the day told people they should let sheep out on the um, Areopagus and then where the sheep should sit down they should put an altar to whatever god it may be that was going to heal them of the plague. So they, they were very superstitious, religious in a perverted, distorted, twisted way. And Paul says, I've seen even your altar to an unknown God. What therefore you in ignorance worship, I declare to you. Paul sets forth the idea that he is in a position to tell them about this God of whom they are really quite ignorant. They know that there's a God. They know they are answerable. They are very superstitious, religious in that sense, and yet they don't know what they're talking about. Paul doesn't come to them and say, well, you've made a pretty good beginning religiously. Let me see if I can take you a little bit further from where you have come. He says, rather, you are worshiping in ignorance, superstitiously, and I will declare this God unto you. And then he goes and he sets forth the Christian worldview. He talks about creation, and he talks about providence, and he talks about the worship of God, and how all men are responsible to him. And so there, Paul, as it were, does not answer the fool according to his folly, lest he be like unto him. He rather answers the fool according to Paul's own Christian worldview, so that he can show that within the context of his worldview, reasoning makes sense, morality makes sense, worship makes sense. Because he's going to go on to ridicule them, as it were, for their worship. He says on the one hand, now notice the internal contradiction in the Greek outlook. He says on the one hand, your own poets say, we are all his offspring. Verse 29, being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone graven by art and device of man. He said, if you really understood that you were the offspring of God, then you would know that God can't be worshipped in the way that you worship him. And when Paul was speaking, very likely on the hill behind him, the Parthenon um, was to be found, which was the temple in which all the Greek gods were worshipped. And Paul is saying very antithetically, you can see how he's setting his worldview against theirs, but showing the internal contradiction within theirs. He says, if you really understood that God uh, was the source of all being, you would know that a temple like this back here is preposterous. God's not worshipped in that way. When Paul declares to them the providence of God and how all things are under his control, he tells us that the reason why God controls all things is so that men might feel after him. Now, the language of feeling after God here is the same language that Homer uses um, about the Cyclops when he loses his eye. He feels around. He's in the darkness. He's trying to find his way, but he's really blinded. And Paul is saying that kind of thing about them. You're feeling around in the darkness trying to find your way. And yet the strange thing is, Paul says, is God is not far from any of us. You in ignorance are seeking after this God. You even have some notion of worship, even though it's self-contradictory. You want to find this God, and yet there's something that's keeping you from doing that. But it's not God's fault. He's not far from any one of us, he tells us that they should seek God if aptly they might feel after him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. In fact, it's impossible for us to think about anything 
to think about reality or think about how we know things or how we should live our lives apart from this God because all of human existence, you see, is part of God's plan and is made possible by God. We live in the very midst of God, as it were. In him we live and move and have our being. And then Paul says, as even your own poets have said, I'll show you how God is not far from each one of us. Even your poets end up having to bring testimony to the truth. They cannot escape the clear revelation of God. Now obviously they have distorted, they have perverted those things which they know. They've tried to make a God after their own image, but even in the process of making a God after their own image, they have not escaped the truth of God. It's kind of like sitting on the volleyball, you know, when you're in the pool. And you're pretending there is no volleyball, and yet you have to be in contact with the volleyball even to distort the truth about the volleyball. And so they are in contact with God. They know things about God, though they are going to distort and suppress an unrighteousness. And then in verse 30, Paul calls upon them to repent because the times of ignorance God will no longer overlook. They should repent knowing that God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. And he's given evidence that that's going to happen because he raised Jesus from the dead. Paul calls on them to repent. The Greek word is metanaeo. It means to turn your mind around. They need to change their attitudes. They need to change their way of thinking. They need to be aware that they are answerable to God and that God has given evidence of that and that he sent his son into this world and raised him from the dead. So Paul sets forth his worldview against the Greek worldview. He does not say, you're perfectly all right as far as you've gone. Now let me see if I can add Jesus to your way of seeing things. He says that his worldview makes sense out of life, whereas theirs ends up in superstition, ignorance, self-contradiction, and judgment. Now, at the end of the encounter, we read that when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Remember, that's where we came into the story. The Epicurean and, and um, Stoic philosophers had heard Paul declare Jesus in the resurrection, and they laughed at him then. He gives his worldview apologetic, and he gets to the resurrection as part of his outlook on life and history, and they laugh at him once again. They reasoned in circles, if you will. They began with that attitude, they ended with that attitude. You need to be aware that people are like that. That didn't change Paul's strategy, it didn't change his confidence in the gospel, that sometimes people are going to make fun of what you believe as a Christian, and they're going to continue making fun of it. They're just not going to pay attention. Even though he has really silenced them, he's made fools out of them and shown how they are mistaken. The Bible does tell us, however, that there were people who wanted to hear more you'll take even greater encouragement from that. There'll be some people who will say, I don't know what to say. I need to think about this. Can we talk some more? That'll be great. And we also have the assurance that, as the text goes on to tell us, certain men clave unto Paul, and two particularly, Dionysius the Areopagite, obviously a well-known citizen, having a title like that, and Damaris, some uh, woman who apparently was uh, a leader in that society as well, since Paul says nothing more except her name. And expects that people, or Luke tells us, that people will recognize who she is. Some of the leading citizens did cleave unto Paul and they did believe. The Holy Spirit does empower the witness of those who are faithful to his word and you will see results. There are going to be people who say, you know, there's really no alternative. I need to turn unto Christ. So here we have an example from the Bible of an encounter between the philosophers of Paul's day and Paul himself, who quite obviously understood the Christian faith and, and uh, knew how to defend it and did so effectively. Now, if you were going to be like Paul, and you were going to encounter the secular philosophers of your day and the unbelieving worldviews of your day, what sorts of things might you say? Obviously, you're not going to go and talk about temples where God is... Uh, is worshipped with the device of men's hands and how absurd that is, you don't have a whole lot of that kind of idolatry around. And so you're going to do an internal critique of the unbeliever's worldview, talking about things which are more contemporary. And I'm going to give you at least four 
handles on apologetics this morning that you can use to begin or pursue a conversation showing the internal problems in the unbeliever's worldview. And I am confident that they are not so time-dated that they only work in the 1960s or the 1970s. These are enduring problems in the history of philosophy. And they will certainly continue to be problems that the unbelieving world is not able to answer um, throughout the history of mankind. I think the form of the problem and the way in which it's discussed may change, but you will be able to use these four problems, I think, very effectively when you're talking with people trying to show why the unbelieving worldview doesn't make sense out of human experience. So let me talk about these four things. First of all, the question of moral absolutes. We have used this illustration a number of times at this conference already. The issue of moral absolutes in the area of ethics. Everybody you encounter is going to have a moral point of view. Even those who say they don't believe in morality will tell you eventually that you should believe that there is no morality rather than believing otherwise. Which is to say they have a morality about no morality. That is, am I going too fast? You got that? They say people shouldn't believe that there is a moral point of view, but that shouldn't believe it is itself a moral point of view, a very perverse one, but nevertheless it is saying something about how you should live your life. No one can avoid giving a moral point of view. Everyone lives in this world and believes certain things are right and wrong, even if the only thing they think is wrong is in believing that anything is wrong. Now, how does the unbelieving world make sense of moral absolutes? Can the unbelieving world make sense of moral absolutes? Our answer is no, it cannot. We're asking which worldview makes human experience intelligible. And now that aspect of human experience we're talking about is judgments of right and wrong and acting as though that there is good and evil in this world. Which worldview can make sense of that? Let's stop and ask ourselves, what are the options if you're a non-Christian? From the Christian standpoint, there is right and wrong because there is a God who is eternal and personal and who reveals himself and shows us what is unchanging um, good and what is evil by contrast. But in the non-Christian worldview, you cannot take good to be whatever God has revealed about his own holy character because you don't believe in this God. So then what is the definition, what is the standard of good if you're a non-Christian? And there are two basic outlooks on this. I'm going to try to simplify all of secular ethics for you this morning. It'll be oversimple, but I trust helpful. The unbelieving world will say that good is what evokes approval, or on the other hand, good is what achieves certain chosen ends. On the one hand, good is what evokes approval, and then there are schools of thought that say good is what achieves certain ends. Let's begin with the first of those options. Good is whatever evokes approval. There are two forms of this outlook on ethics. The one says that good is whatever evokes social approval, the other says, good is what evokes your individual personal approval. That is to say, the evoking of approval is either society at large or the individual himself, herself. <clears throat> the difficulty with this point of view, obviously, is that it makes a sentence, well, let's take the view that good is what evokes social approval. If that is the case, and we are consistent with that approach, you're going to answer the fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. Let's take this philosophy and see where it leads us. If that is the case, then a sentence such as, the entire society willingly went along with the evil of oppressing the Jews. Now that sentence seems to make perfectly good sense. But if good is defined by what evokes approval, then it would be by definition impossible to criticize a society for what it does. 
But even unbelievers criticize societies for what they do. They believe that societies are humane or inhumane. They believe that societies are too warlike. They believe sometimes that societies are too uptight about sexual ethics. They make evaluations of societies as a whole, and those evaluations would be meaningless if good is whatever evokes approval by the society at large. Moreover, we ordinarily think of things evoking approval or disapproval, if you want to look at the negative side of ethics, we ordinarily think of things evoking approval because they are good. We don't think of the evoking approval as constituting their goodness. You understand the difference? If you ask, well, why did that evoke society's approval? Or why did that evoke society's disapproval? We tend to think that good and evil are attributes of the things, events, activities, attitudes in themselves, and not simply another way of speaking of evoking approval. The unbelieving world cannot even understand the, the logic and the language of ethical discourse. You're going to take what anyone is going to be talking about in human experience, their moral judgments, and show that their own theory of ethics is meaningless. The very things they say are meaningless given their philosophy of ethics. The idea that good is what evokes social approval um, is found also in the view that good and evil are just intuited by people. We can't argue about it, it's just something that you intuit. You have this feeling about it. And if that, of course, is what the unbeliever means by good, then there is no rational discussion of ethics left and no way to resolve differences of opinion. In fact, there's no way to even say that a person's intuition about what is good is itself good, because then you would have to intuit that your intuition is right, which is to say you would have to intuit that your intuition about your intuition is right, which is another way of saying you'd have to intuit that your intuition about your intuition about your intuition is right. And do you see where I'm going? Intuitionism leads to an infinite regress. There is no explanation here of good and evil, and there's no rational way of resolving disagreements between different societies. We would have absolutely no right to criticize another culture for, say, um, expecting that the widow of a man will throw herself on his funeral pyre and burn to death and force her to do so if she refuses to do it willingly. There are societies that have practiced that. Not many unbelievers want to say, hey, well, it's different strokes for different folks. I guess if that's what they think is good, they go ahead and do that. We tend to say that's horrible and they should be changed. We tend to think the cannibalism ought to be changed. The child abuse cannot be made acceptable just because it's widespread in a culture. We, can't, we don't think that genocide is acceptable just because Hitler's Germany put up with it. And so the unbeliever can't live with that particular theory. Now, the idea that good evokes individual approval rather than social approval ends up in what is now called the emotivist theory of ethics then when we talk about ethical terms like good and evil, we're just giving expression to our emotions. We're not really rationally describing anything. In which case, it would never be the... When someone says helping orphans is good, when Bill says that, he would not be saying the same thing as Ted when Ted says that. If Ted says helping orphans is good, what he's saying there is, Ted likes helping orphans. When Bill says helping orphans is good, that translates, Bill likes helping orphans. And so they're not even saying the same thing when they say helping orphans is good. Good is not an objective or public quality, it's just a subjective expression of your emotion, which then makes ethics impossible and completely subjectivistic. So this idea that good is what evokes approval, either social or individual, doesn't make any sense, cannot make meaningful the judgments on ethics that every unbeliever makes. And so we go the other direction. How about the idea that good is what achieves chosen ends?
That is to say, something is good when it leads to a certain consequence, when it's the means to a particular end. Utilitarians tell us the good that we should try to um, achieve, the consequence that we are aiming for, is the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. Hedonists that are egoistic, on the other hand, tell us the good we should be looking for is our own individual happiness, pleasure, and well-being. But now, either way, if good is what is conducive to the end that you have chosen, the question has now just been transferred from the means to the end that the means is supposed to be unto. That is to say, when the unbeliever says, I mean by good that which achieves social happiness or individual well-being, the next question is, well, why is the greatest happiness of the greatest number good? And you can't say because that achieves a certain end. If you define good in a consequentialist or what is called a, teleologic, a teleological fashion, if good is that which is conducive to a certain end, that already assumes that the end is itself good. And now we're right back into the thick of it. How do you know that that is good? And the unbelieving world doesn't have an answer for that. It's like, well, everyone's just supposed to take for granted that your individual well-being is good. You're just to take for granted that the happiness of your society is good. But even then we have to ask, in saying this, what do we mean by the word good? The unbeliever knows in his heart of hearts, in her heart of hearts, that good has to do with matching God's attitude toward things. Evil is that which goes contrary to God's feelings about certain things and against his character. And they use good, the language of goodness and evil, in that absolutistic way, and then they try to find some theory to cover it up. As Paul says, I find that you are very superstitious. You have all of this evidence of uh, ethics around you in your society, and yet you can't make any sense of ethics, given your worldview. And so this God that you worship in ignorance, this absolute standard of goodness, that you know is there but you cannot understand, given your worldview, I can declare unto you. So there's one line that you can take, and I think everybody can understand this. Usually the discussion of moral right and wrong is not all that philosophically technical or difficult for people. Let's, let's up the ante a bit here, though. Secondly, you can talk to people about the uniformity of nature, which is to say the very possibility of doing science. You have to put on your thinking caps now. If we're going to talk about the uniformity of nature and the possibility of science, you have to stop and ask, why is this relevant to science? What does science study? When all said and done, science studies predictability in human experience. When you do experiments in the chemistry lab or the physics lab, when you study engineering and how to build bridges and so forth, you are studying those things which, if you were to believe them, would enable you to control the world and control your experience better. If you knew the properties of quinine and how it acts on the human body, then you could predict that using quinine would relieve the symptoms of malaria. If you understood, you know, your experiments in the... Um, in the medical lab, then you would find out something about the serum used to cure or prevent polio. The whole idea of science is we learn things about our past experience so that that knowledge will help us control our experience in the future. It's not just scientists who think that way. Every individual does so as well. You know how to ride a bike? You know how to drive a car. You don't learn that new every day. You take what you've learned in the past and you assume that that is usable in the future. That is to say that future experience will be like past experience. Now there would be no science, there would be no university for that matter, if we couldn't count on the future being like the past, if we couldn't count on the uniformity of nature. Everyone assumes the uniformity of nature. 
And now the question you want to raise is, which worldview makes human experience, that is the expectation that the future will be like the past, that there's a causal connection in this world that you can rely on to make predictions and to plan your life and do things, which worldview makes that human experience intelligible? Now everyone assumes this, but no one's worldview can account for it apart from the Christian. You see, we have no experience of the future. We have no observation of the future. An unbeliever says we only know things based on our observations and experience. And then you're going to point out, well, then of course you haven't observed the future, have you? You have no experience of what is not yet. Now since you believe everything you know is based on observation, and even you admit you have not observed the future, then anything you say about past experience, we've seen this in the laboratory a thousand times. People have known this for thousands of years. You'll hear things like this. No matter what they say about the past, eventually, you're going to point out, is logically irrelevant to what's in the future. The fact that you have some observation, some experience, all these lab reports about the past still provides no relevant information about the way things will be in the future. It does not provide you any basis for expecting the future to be like the past apart from a doctrine about the nature of reality that tells you that events and effects are controlled in a uniform way. Apart from, say, knowing a God who assures us that he will keep things regular in this universe and that our experience is predictable, therefore, apart from a doctrine like that, they couldn't have any rational basis for assuming the future would be like the past. And yet all of science assumes this. And then when you bring up the question, it's like they don't even want to think about that. It's so difficult and it's so taken for granted that they almost want to make fun of you for raising the question. But you have to remember, being made fun of for raising a question doesn't mean the question is a bad question. Often enough, it means you finally touched a nerve, and they don't want to admit that you've touched a nerve. Now, someone as sophisticated as Bertrand Russell, about whom you read in preparation for today's class, uh, someone like Bertrand Russell has uh, admitted in print and with a great deal of sophistication in the explanation, that we just have to admit that the principle of induction, that is to say, the idea that we can take past experiences and, pro and project them into the future, that we can know and control the future to some degree by our knowledge of the past, has no foundation in observation, has no scientific foundation. So you can talk about moral absolutes with an unbeliever, you can talk about the very possibility of science and the uniformity of the world that would be required to do scientific work at all. Now I'm going to bump this up again. Let's raise the ante. I, I'm forcing you to think hard. This is going to be the hardest one of the day. After this it's downhill. Another problem that unbelievers have, no matter what version of uh, a philosophy they use, whatever worldview they have, is that unbelievers have got to talk about the possibility of universals and laws. That is to say, they have got to talk about concepts and logic. In order to understand this challenge, we need to take a moment and explain what a universal is. You all know the story of Huey, Dewey, and Louie, right? When you see Huey, Dewey, and Louie out on the pond, you say there are three what? Oh, we're awake. Come on, come on, come on. Ducks. Three ducks. Very good. Okay. Now, what does this term duck refer to? Does it refer to Huey rather than Louie? Or does it refer to Dewey instead of Huey? Which one is it? What do you mean all of them? If you as an unbeliever 
hold that the only thing that exists are particular experiences, then you can't say that a word applies to many things. A word can only apply to one thing at a time. When unbelievers use general concepts like duckness or hoarseness or goodness, for that matter, they are not talking about something that they have experienced. Now, you're going to say, wait a minute, they have experienced, because they've experienced, through observation, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Ah, that's true. But what they have not experienced is duckness. And you know how I know they have not experienced that? Because this is not very pleasant, but you, know, you, could, you could make dinner out of Huey, Dewey, and Louie, but you can't make dinner out of duckness. You see, duckness is not the same kind of thing as a particular in this world. It's a concept, right? It's not a physical object at all. And so when unbelievers talk about general concepts, they need some worldview that makes human experience intelligible. You need to ask, what view of the world makes meaningful your discussion of concepts or universals like duckness or atomic structure or love for that matter. How can you have general concepts in a world that you say is made up only of physical particulars? Now real quickly so that you see some of the difficulty of this problem that I'm summarizing so quickly, you're going to have people who say, no we do have an experience of duckness. And here it is. Now, your experience of that word written on the board is a sense-based experience. That's something physical in the world. And duck is just a word that we use for things that we see having common features. Duck is just then the language itself rather than an immaterial concept. And I want to show you how easy it is to refute this point of view. Let's assume that this written up here on the board is duckness. All right, you all know the concept of duckness and it's right there on the board. There goes duckness. It don't exist anymore. If the unbeliever seriously believes that concepts are nothing more than the physical airwaves that we hear audibly or see with our eyes a physical thing written down, then what you need to do is you need to point out that if we eliminate those physical objects in the world, then there is no more concept of duck. When I teach philosophy, um, I have a lot of fun with new students by asking them, what is their name? Okay, and let's say we have a student who says his name is Jim, and then I'll ask him, is that your name? Yeah, that's my name. Seriously, that's your name? You don't want to be more precise? No, that's my name. What are you getting at? And I say, well, if that is your name, you're now nameless. And all of a sudden, you see, the light dawns. Wait a minute, that's not my name. That is an instance of my name. That is a representation of my name. That's one example of my name. But I've got a name even when no one is saying Jim and when it's not written down on a piece of paper anywhere. If we destroyed every piece of paper that had the name Jim, even his birth certificate, he'd still be Jim, wouldn't he? And so there is a concept of gymnas, if you will. There is a name that goes beyond anything in the physical world and anything in experience that can be observed in a sense-based fashion. And so it is with darkness and love and justice and any number of things. Concepts are not material objects. Concepts are abstract in character abstract and universal. But you see, the problem is, in a materialistic philosophy, 
where everything that exists must be material, there can't be anything that is abstract and universal, because everything must be particular and physical, which is to say the unbeliever can't even make sense of his talking and his reasoning. Now, you know what unbelievers do? Then they, they try to come up with more sophisticated theories which are behavioristic in nature. What they want to say is, well, words are understood in terms of stimulus response mechanisms. And I cannot, in the short time we have this morning, go into much of that. But the critique that I've given you works with behaviorism as it does with any other school of philosophy. Is it the case that a name is nothing more than a sophisticated way, sophisticated way of speaking of a response to a certain kind of stimulus? Do we really want to say then that the concept of duck no longer exists when there isn't any conditioned response stimulus out there? Let's talk about something a little more abstract even than duckness and names. Let's talk about the laws of logic. The laws of logic regulate, are meant to regulate human reasoning, the way in which we draw conclusions from premises. Now, if you maintain that there is nothing that exists except the material world, the physical world about us, then what are laws of logic? Unbelievers want to appeal to them. You'll hear them tell you you're being illogical, or you need to take a course in logic, or you need to reason more logically. And you have every right to say, what are you referring to? Now, in my worldview, it makes sense to call on people to be logical, because in so doing, they imitate the very nature of God. They think the way God thinks. They are consistent. God doesn't lie. He is true to himself. God is logical. And I need to think in a way that reflects the character of God. So it makes sense for the Christian to call on people to be logical. What sense does it make for the unbeliever to call on people to be logical? What are the laws of logic? I've had people tell me, well, they're just, you know, the way your brain thinks. You say, wait a minute. Lo the, <laughs> the laws of logic are the way that the human brain thinks. Well, if the laws of logic are the way the human brain thinks, then we don't need laws of logic to correct the way the human brain thinks, do we? Obviously, the laws of logic are not simply a description of the function of the brain or it wouldn't make any sense to take courses in logic so you can learn to think more logically. You can only think the way the human brain thinks after all. No, 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 no. What I mean is the laws of logic don't simply describe the way the human brain thinks, but the laws of logic are the, what the human brain thinks about the way the human brain should think. That is to say, the laws of logic are what are going on right now in the electrical synapse and, and, uh, and the biological and physical uh, relations inside the gray tissue up here in my cranium. The laws of logic are what I'm thinking about, and by thinking I mean all that electrical stuff going on and chemical stuff going on up in my head. But if those are the laws of logic, then obviously the laws of logic are different for you than they are for me, and why is that? because the gray matter in your cranium is not the gray matter in my cranium. And if the laws of logic are just what's going on in the gray matter, even thinking about what should go on in the gray matter, then obviously there's nothing common and public and objective about the laws of logic. The unbeliever wants, I know that this is difficult, I told you this is the hardest it's going to get, so stick with me two more minutes and the pain will be gone. The laws of logic are crucial to any kind of rational thinking. Education would not make sense. Debating would not make sense unless people were committed, in some sense, to common laws of reasoning as to what controls good and bad uh, conclusions, reliable and unreliable conclusions, and patterns of inference that will lead to the truth. Everyone needs laws of logic in terms of education, debate, argumentation, what have you. And yet the unbelieving worldview cannot make the laws of logic intelligible. 
Here again, the unbeliever shows that he or she knows God, knows that God is an intelligent, personal, reliable, consistent, faithful being, and that they must be like that. They must think logically and consistently, but they don't want to acknowledge God, so they suppress the truth and unrighteousness and come up with some phony theory to explain the laws of logic. Okay, I said there would be four illustrations I gave you this morning. We've talked about moral absolutes. You are able to talk to the unbeliever about the basis of morality. We've talked, secondly, about the uniformity of nature. You are able to talk to the unbeliever about the possibility of any science. We've talked about the possibility of universals and laws. You are able to talk to the unbeliever about concepts and logic and to say, how does your worldview make any of that even sensible? And then fourthly, and real briefly, let's talk about personal freedom and dignity. Unbelievers have certain assumptions about human nature. And those assumptions about human nature lead them to say that human beings are different from the animal world, even if they believe in evolution. And therefore, our thinking is in a classification different from what other biological organisms are doing. And the treatment of human beings needs to recognize their dignity in a way that we don't with other things. Here's a real obvious illustration of that. Do you see anything in the animal world that is likened to a funeral? The animals have rituals for burying their dead. No. Now, if the unbeliever says we're nothing more than advanced animals, it would make perfectly good sense to ask why do we have funerals? Even unbelievers have funerals. In fact, it, it's some of the, the grossest display of social hypocrisy in the world you've ever seen on the evening news when some well-known actor or actress dies. And everyone, I mean, it's almost the end of the world. We're going to miss this person. It's so t Well, I know what it is to lose a loved one, and I understand the grief of a funeral. I don't understand this public display and all this oopla and so forth. If all we are, of course, is the front end of evolutionary change. If we're nothing more but advanced animals, why do we have funerals? Why do we, in some sense, express the dignity of human nature and man in that way? Now, I'll tell you why, because in our heart of hearts, we know that man is different. The man's made in the image of God, and something very tragic has taken place when a human dies. We don't have funerals when a cockroach dies. We don't, well, some people do. I mean, people have funerals for their dogs. Isn't that something? What are we doing when we have a funeral for a dog, however? I mean, besides making fools out of ourselves, we are personifying the dog, treating the dog like a human being. And so this is not an exception to the rule I've given you, it's the exception that proves the rule. The only reason a person buries their dog and doesn't bury their cockroach is because they think of their dog as more personal, more like them. My dog was a friend to me, the cockroach wasn't, which is to say I treated my dog or thought of my dog like a human being to some extent. Human dignity is something which the unbelieving world cannot explain. The very fact that we have law courts, as bad as they work sometimes, nevertheless, the very fact that we have law courts shows that we believe, in some extent, in human dignity. We believe that a person needs to be convicted of something before you can fine him, imprison him, or take away his life. But again, if this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, if there is no God, then why do we afford dignity any more to human beings trying them than, say, before we slaughter cattle and then eat them in our steak dinners? The unbelieving world can talk, and you're going to hear more of this as you go to college in your generation. The unbelieving world wants to talk about all living things being equal. All life must be respected. And if that's the case, then you need to learn to press to absurdity
the worldview that says that kind of thing. If all living things have equal dignity, it will not be enough to become a vegetarian. You ever stop to think about how absurd it is when you hear people say it's cruelty to animals to eat them? Hey, I'm going to start a carrot liberation organization. That's cruelty to carrots to eat them, too. Oh, in fact, if you want to push hard enough, it's cruelty for you to be breathing because even though you're not conscious of it, you're killing microbes right now as you breathe. Yeah, so stop breathing. Live up to your worldview. Die. <laughs> Respect all living things by dying. There's the internal contradiction, the absurdity of the unbeliever's worldview. What I'm getting at here is that a naturalistic, non-Christian worldview cannot account for the personal freedom of our thinking and the personal um, dignity that we afford in treating one another. Let me talk about freedom in our thinking. If naturalism is true, that is, that all that exists is the natural order, and there isn't anything that goes beyond man's experience and time. If naturalism is true, then the naturalist has no reason to believe his naturalism. You write that down and I'll explain why it's true. If naturalism is true, the naturalist has no reason to believe it. Has no reason to believe it. Because you see, naturalism says all of our thinking is just electrical chemical responses. All of our thinking is subject to the laws of chemistry and physics, which is to say all of our thinking is determined by the factors in the physical world or in the physical brain in the environment around us. All of our thinking is, in principle, predictable then, because it's just following the laws of nature. Uh, usually, more sophisticatedly put, the laws of physics and biology and chemistry and so forth. But the point is, human thinking is just the species of the physical world and its operation. Human thinking is just, it's on the same order, but not the same level of sophistication as weeds growing. And so if naturalism is true, then the person who's propounding it is propounding it, why? Because his or her brain has required them by the laws of physics and chemistry and biology to say this sort of thing. It's not as though they have the freedom and self-awareness to think about different theories, evaluate evidence, and make a choice as to which is right or wrong. They just have to say whatever they have to say. And that's why the irony is that a naturalist would promote naturalism and try to tell people it's true. You should believe that and not supernaturalism. The answer is, if naturalism is true, so that your brain is just working on the laws of physics, then you have no reason to believe naturalism is true. It's just the laws of physics requiring you to say that. Which is just to say, if naturalism is true, there's no reason to say that naturalism is true. You're just forced to say that, just like I'm forced by the laws of physics to say the opposite. Unbelievers cannot even account for why we argue with each other then, can they? On their assumptions, there's no argument because there's no freedom to choose the truth over against error. There's just the laws of physics governing my brain to say and do whatever it does. All right, there's been a lot of material here, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't leave before you had some idea of how you can engage in a worldview critique of the unbeliever. You do not have to have read everything in philosophy, but I would recommend that you do some study in philosophy. You might do well to do it under a Christian instructor. I'd be happy to help you uh, study philosophy through our study center, for instance. Or when you go to school, make sure you have a Christian or a Christian textbook that you're looking at. But you should become more familiar with these terms with these concepts and ideas so you can talk intelligently and you can have more confidence in what you're doing. But even if you haven't mastered the field of philosophy, you can do what I've taught you in this conference. Get the unbeliever to keep talking and he or she will finally give you the rope with which you can hang them. And here are some of the ropes that you can hang them with. Moral absolutes, the uniformity of nature, therefore the possibility of science, the possibility of universals, and laws, therefore logic and rationality, personal freedom and dignity.
learn to talk to people about these things. They are enduring problems in the history of philosophy, regardless of the school of thought that you come up against. All right, let's see if we can put this into more concrete um, form by looking at two illustrations of apologetics. First of all, you have listened, um, if you did your preparation, to a tape of a dialogue that I had with an atheist whose name was George Smith. George Smith wrote the book, Atheism, the Case Against God. And I've written down just a few things that I'd like to comment on about that tape, and if we have time this morning, I'll let you ask any questions you might have, and if we don't have time, see me after class. But I hope that you picked up on a few of these salient points in the um, discussion or dialogue or debate with him. First of all, the importance of definitions. If you listen to the tape, you'll hear George Smith, by the way, he does the same thing that Gordon Stein did that I debated at the University of California a few years ago. He wants to define atheism in a particularly narrow way. And you'll hear me give some resistance to that. Well, if you want to use your term that way, I'll try to use that. But you have to understand that if you define atheism in this fashion, in a sense you're begging the question. The title of George Smith's book is Atheism, the Case Against God. And then he comes on the radio program with me and he says, well, an atheist is somebody who doesn't believe that the evidence in favor of God is compelling. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Those are really quite different things, aren't they? When the atheist says, I have a case against God, what he's saying is, I have an argument, I have evidence that shows that or leads to the conclusion that there is no God. And then he shows up for the debate and he goes, well, what I mean by that is, you haven't convinced me that there's a God. So if he's allowed to define atheism in that way, then of course he has shifted the burden of proof, hasn't he? Now he doesn't have to give a case against God. All he has to do is sit back and say, well, I'm not convinced, I'm not convinced, I'm not convinced. You haven't come up with the right argument yet. Okay, the importance of definitions. If I had another week with you, we would probably spend two or three hours just on this, and I've taken two or three minutes. I haven't done it justice. You must watch the way the unbeliever defines his or her terms. Much of a debate, much of an argument is determined by the way you lay it out, the way you set up the question, the way you conceptualize things. If atheism is rational, and all that means is they haven't been convinced by the theist, then it looks like atheism can win the argument with very little work at all. But if atheism means somebody who has evidence against the existence of God, then they're going to have to do a lot more than simply try to refute the arguments we bring up. They're going to have to have their own evidence. They're going to have to have their own reasons to show that there is no God. The second thing I would have you catch on to in that discussion with George Smith is this whole notion of the relationship of faith and reason. One of the reasons that George Smith had a hard time dealing with the worldview that I was giving to him is because he had assumed all along, in fact you find it in his book on atheism, he had assumed that faith is believing something without reason. As he puts it in his book, faith just fills in the gaps where reason falls short. Where reason can't show something, then we say we believe it on faith. And you are going to hear this over, and I mean, to the point that you'll get tired of it if you're paying attention. This notion that faith and reason stand over against each other. And it doesn't help that traditional Roman Catholic apologetics assumes the same thing. Reason is one kind of thing, and faith goes beyond reason. The notion here is that everyone uses their intellectual power, their reasoning ability, and with that, we can assume a certain, we can find out certain truths about human life in the universe and even that there is a God. And then we go beyond that and put faith on the foundation that reason has laid. So that faith, you see, is what goes beyond reason. So even the Roman Catholic Church teaches that. We have many evangelicals who teach that. That reason lays the foundation and faith is what goes beyond it and is placed on the foundation of reason. Well, I suggested to George Smith that that is a 
Thomistic, which is to say a perspective following Thomas Aquinas, a medieval theologian. But in the history of the Christian church, there's a completely different tradition on this matter, which is the Augustinian tradition. It goes back to Augustine in the early days of the Christian church. And in the Augustinian tradition, faith is not that which goes on the foundation of reason and therefore is of a different order and goes beyond it. Faith itself is the foundation for all reasoning. Whoa, boy, that changes things, doesn't it? What I wanted to suggest to him is that if you don't have faith in God, you can't reason at all. That one believes in order to understand. One doesn't first rationally understand and then says, well, now I can take the leap of faith beyond that. But rather, without this faith in God, all reasoning would fail in principle, in principle, all reasoning would fail without that faith in God. It makes no sense. There is no worldview. There is no view of reality, knowledge, and ethics that can make sense of reasoning. And in the tape, you could hear that. I mean, he really had no answer to that. He didn't know what to do with that. And so what he said is, now, well, that can't be true because I reason and I don't have faith. And I, the smiles on your faces indicate that you are intelligent enough to see that he had walked right into my parlor, hadn't he? Thank you for taking the bait. <clears throat> because what he was saying is, well, I guess I do know God in my heart of hearts, even though I refuse to um, acknowledge it. Because <clears throat> my challenge is, <clears throat> pardon me, you cannot account for your reasoning on your worldview, your atheistic worldview. And if he says, oh, but I reason anyway, and I say, exactly, because you know the God that I'm testifying to. And so you heard, if you listened to the discussion, I said, well, George, that's because we believe that in your heart of hearts you do know God. And that's why he's unhappy with you, because you don't give him the glory, and you don't openly profess him. You use what God has taught you about the world, what you know through God's revelation, you act like you're a believer, and then you turn right around and you won't profess it with your mouth. What you know in your heart, you won't say with your mouth, and that's why you're in trouble with God. That's why you're guilty before God. I hope you all caught that. I mean, when he said, well, you've got to be wrong because I reason and I'm not a believer, what he had really done is he had, he had just pushed right to the conclusion that I wanted all along. What did we call that yesterday? We call that self-deception. When somebody believes something and yet convinces themselves that they do not believe it. Self-deception is one of the most common things we see in the world. It's a sad thing. Um, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on self-deception because I thought it was so important for Christian apologetics. Well, let me just give you an example that I used there in the doctoral dissertation. You have a, a mother who loves her child. Maybe she is um, a widow. She doesn't have anybody else in her world. No other significant other except this child. And yet her child is really a bad child. He abuses the other children on the playground, steals their lunch money, is just basically a bully. But this mother has got to think of her child as being angelic. Because if she doesn't have an angelic child, if she has really a demonic child, if she has some really monster of a child, then what is she as a mother? And so for the sake of her own well-being and dignity, she must convince herself that her child is really good. But then, you see, there's mounting evidence that their chi her child is not good. Always in the principal's office, always being disciplined at school, expelled from school. It's always any number of people saw your little Johnny beat up these children and take their lunch money. But she's got to believe, no, they've got it in for Johnny. They are, they're following a vendetta against Johnny. So she takes Johnny out of school and puts him in another school, transfers. She moves to another neighborhood so she doesn't have to hear these stories about Johnny anymore. And she acts like Johnny is an angel. She tells her neighbors what a wonderful child she has. She thinks about him that way. She trusts him around her pocketbook. Any number of other evidences that she wants to believe with all her heart that he's a good kid. But the evidence keeps mounting. And now in the new school, she's 
finding that he's in trouble. He's in the principal's office, being disciplined, being expelled from school. She goes down there and she says, you have it in for Johnny. Everyone tries to counsel her. We don't have it in for Johnny. He's a brat. He's a bully. You're going to have to do something with this kid. No, 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 no. You've probably heard from the other school district. She moves to another neighborhood, puts Johnny in another school. The thing happens again and again. Now, what are we going to say eventually about this poor woman? Does she believe that Johnny is a good kid? No. Her very behavior and the way she deals with the evidence against Johnny shows she doesn't believe he's a good kid. Has she convinced himself, herself that he is a good kid? Yes, she has. That's why there's evidence that she treats him in this way and she promotes him and says he's such an angel when she meets the new neighbors and so forth. Here is a woman who classically knows the truth and has deceived herself about it. Now that is just a little microcosm, a little way of seeing what unbelievers do all the time. They know God in their heart of hearts and then they go about finding rationalizations to not have to acknowledge it. And the rationalizations may not be as crass as the ones in the story of the lady with the bully child that I've just given you. They may be very sophisticated. They may be rationalizations that come from a person that's a real smooth talker, who has plenty of educational experience, PhDs galore. And he or she can hide their desire to run away from God in a very um, convincing, persuasive way. It's obviously convinced or persuaded them. And yet they could not talk about rationality, they could not talk about science, they could not talk about human dignity and freedom or moral absolutes, given the worldview that they are promoting. And so when they do talk about these things, they are showing that they are self-deceived. They know God in their heart of hearts. That's what you were hearing in that little part of the dialogue with George Smith when I confronted him and said, George, you really do know this God, even though you don't admit it. Thirdly, I hope that you noted in the dialogue with George Smith that he had no reason for being rational. He wrote in his book, he thought he was ridiculing Christians when he said this, by the way, that he didn't want any irrationality, any faith statements. People must be rational, he said, because otherwise it's not conducive to human life. And what I asked him was, George, why should people be rational? And then before he answered, I said, now I know in your book you say because it's conducive to human life. But why should people do that which is conducive to human life? It's kind of like, duh. Ooh. I've got this end I'm pursuing, but I, I'm not sure why I'm pursuing it. And I said, now given my worldview, it makes sense to tell people to be rational. We have to think God's thoughts after him, and he's consistent and rational. So that's fine. What I don't understand is why on your worldview people have to be rational. Fourthly, the discussion of abstract concepts, which began with George Smith, continued with the telephone callers, one in particular named Max, who got very upset. <laughs> you all know how Max got upset. <laughs> Finally, just, you know, just wanted to end the conversation. There again, and, and I, don't, I, I am concerned, of course, for Max's salvation, so don't take this humor in the wrong way, but what I told you is apologetics it's not my job to change his heart. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It is my job to close his mouth. And in his case, he gave an open demonstration of that when he just wanted to end the conversation. Well, enough of this. And of course, he will say to the people that he talks to and his friends that he ended the conversation because of this stupid Christian over here who couldn't understand things. But you listen to the conversation. It's pretty clear, isn't it, who didn't understand things. Not that he's going to be willing to bite the bullet and say, I didn't have an answer. But I said, you know, where do these laws or concepts come from for you? And he said, well, the human brain does. I said, you don't want to say that. Wait a minute. Because on your worldview, the human brain, which is made up of matter and controlled by biological or chemical or physical laws, deals only with particulars. But concepts are universal. Concepts are immaterial. So that isn't the answer you want to give. And he said, it's just natural. For which now my circle of friends have a joke going, saying we've been looking for these laws in the natural world. I ask him, where are they growing these concepts? Can we find them in California anywhere? Which was a way of, I hope, not ridiculing him, but using some holy mockery of his worldview. 
The possibility of abstract concepts, um, well, abstract concepts become impossible is what I want to say given the atheist worldview. We talked about the uniformity of nature. George Smith said, well, that's just the physical qualities of things, right? It's just the attributes of matter that we see, and that's why we expect the future to be like the past. Last night I already answered that for you. Well, why are the attributes of matter that we know from the past those which we expect to be true of matter in the future? And then one more thing that you should have picked up on in the tape is when one of the um, Christians who called in confronted George Smith about the origin of life. And I sat there, I wasn't but three feet away from him, and I, I mean, I just looked him in the face and I was appalled at the way he answered this caller. The caller wanted to know what the origin of life is, and he just said, I don't know. That's for the scientists to decide. I was saying, whoa, wait a minute, George. If you're going to give us a view of the world, if you're going to give us your worldview, talking about the nature of reality and how we know and how we should live our lives, you can't just throw away one of the most difficult questions in the history of philosophy. You can't just throw away what people in all cultures have wanted to know. Where does life come from? And he just wants to say, oh, well, you know, it's up for the scientists to decide. And then he has the audacity to ridicule my Christian brothers for being arbitrary and believing things on faith. Do you see the hypocrisy of that? Well, it's for the scientists to decide. Well, what happens to rationality, George? What happens to your critical mindset, George? Just whatever the scientists say, George, they become your priest? You make fun of Christians for believing what the preacher says just because it's in a book. And you do the very same thing. The difference is you've chosen somebody else to be your priest. Oh, whatever the scientists say. And who knows where life comes from? And I, I hope you picked up on the fact that I pushed the question further. I said, well, this is one of the problems we Christians have with you atheists. You believe the most remarkable things on faith. You have your miracles too. Life comes from non-life. What a remarkable thing to believe. Intelligence comes from non-intelligence. What a remarkable leap of faith. Morality comes from non-morality. How do you do it, George? And here you're making fun of others for having faith. You do an internal critique of the fool's worldview. Answer the fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. But then don't answer the fool according to his folly. You set forth your own worldview as the only one where those things that you're talking about in human experience, laws of logic, the findings of science, the absolutes of morality, the freedom and dignity of human beings, those things that you're talking about make sense within your worldview and don't make any sense within the unbelievers. So this is what we mean by an antithetical or presuppositional approach to defending the faith. Now we need to quickly look at our last illustration and that's the article that I've written on Bertrand Russell's little piece, Why I Am Not a Christian. Uh, this will be appearing soon in American Visions, uh, The Biblical Worldview, and you have an advanced copy of it here for the sake of our discussion and illustration of what I've been trying to teach you. I give a little bit of background on Bertrand Russell um, at the beginning of the article, pointing out that he was a controversial figure in 20th century philosophy, but a well-respected figure in 20th century philosophy. And yet a man, for all of his dignity as a philosopher and his reputation, a man who changed points of view more times than you would expect of a very intelligent person. This shows, in one sense, Russell's integrity, that when he ran into problems with a particular philosophical outlook, he realized that he couldn't just, you know, entrench himself and try to rationalize and, and, and defend it to the hilt. He was a man who was willing to change his mind. That's good. What's bad is the fact that he kept changing his mind showed that he didn't really have a foundation for what he believed. He didn't really know what life was all about, even though he was respected is revered by students. In fact, you read some of the stuff that his students wrote about him and 
It's almost like he walked on water. He was a very intelligent man, and yet he didn't know what everything was about. He couldn't come up with an epistemology, a theory of knowledge, that avoided certain internal problems. And he himself recognized that. And even his better students will write. Russell himself didn't have an adequate answer for some of these problems. <clears throat> and, and yet, this same man knew very well that Christianity was wrong. Now you need to put these two things together about what you know about Russell because they make an interesting dialectical tension. On the one hand, Russell said, we really can't come up, or we haven't yet come up, with an adequate theory of knowledge. But even though we haven't arrived at that, we know that you aren't right. <laughs> Nobody knows for sure, Russell said, but we know that you're wrong, you Christians. So you can't have it both ways, can you? You can't say, nobody knows for sure, or I haven't got an adequate theory of knowledge, but on the other hand, I do know that you don't know what you're talking about. Just won't work. He's got to have some viable alternative on the basis of which and in terms of which he attacks the Christian faith. <clears throat> I point out next in the article that Russell was hostile toward religion in general and Christianity in particular, saying that religion was really an impediment to human progress. I quote him as saying, I am as firmly convinced that religions do harm as I am that they are untrue. And we see a defined expression of his own atheism and materialism in his article, A Free Man's Worship. This is what I quote him as saying there. Brief and powerless is man's life. On him and all his race, the slow, sure doom falls pitiless and dark, blind to good and evil, reckless of destruction, omnipotent matter rolls on its relentless way. And in the face of that nihilism and ethical subjectivity, Russell called men to what he thought was an invigorating free man's worship. He said, to worship at the shrine that his own hands have built, undismayed by the empire of chance. Oh, these are stirring words, but you, look at what he's saying. Omnipotent matter rolls on its relentless way. This is a chance universe. Only matter exists. And yet on the other hand, he says, we are to assert our own values in the face of that blind, relentless matter. Values? There are no values in a universe that's made up only of matter. So here you have a man who was a brilliant man, a good public speaker, could write stirring prose like that, and yet openly contradicts himself. Has a worldview that cannot even make sense out of his own speech here. Now why did Russell say he couldn't be a Christian? Well, I give four reasons in the article that summarize what he said in his article, Why I Am Not a Christian. He said, because the existence of God cannot be proved by unaided reason. What I go on to say in the article is, unaided reason can't prove anything. And that's demonstrated in terms of what I've showed you this morning. Russell had no answer for the uniformity of nature by his own admission. He said, past observation cannot lay a rational foundation for future expectation. And yet he continued to act like we could be scientific. Russell said that there are serious defects in the character and teaching of Jesus, that he wasn't the wisest and best of men, but inferior to Buddha and Socrates. And yet Russell also says that there's no foundation for objective and absolute values. Now, if you don't have an objective value by which you evaluate Jesus and Buddha and Socrates, then how can you say that one's inferior or superior to the other? Russell just shot himself in the foot, didn't he, in trying to argue that way. He says that people accept religion on emotional grounds, which is not worthy of self-respecting human beings. At the end of the article, I point out that Bertrand Russell didn't have good intellectual grounds for what he was saying and that we need to look elsewhere for why he hated Christianity so much. 
What I'm suggesting is his was an emotional aversion to Christianity just as much as he said Christians and religious people on the basis of emotion believe what they do. That is to say he was guilty of the very thing he was accusing others of. And finally he said the Christian religion has been and still is the principal enemy of moral progress in the world. But of course the whole notion of moral progress requires for its meaning some absolute standard of value in terms of which things progress or are retrogressive. And we've already indicated Russell didn't have any such absolute standard whatsoever. In fact, on his view, history wouldn't have any meaning whatsoever, much less a progressive view, um, a meaning that shows progress in history. Now, I've run out of time, and that's why um, I've had to hurry through this article. But since you have it in your hands, um, you can go and look at that and examine it more. I hope that you will see in the article an illustration of the principles of defending the faith that I've been laying out for you these last few days here at our conference. At the opening of the article, there is a summary of the approach to apologetics which I am using in this series for American Vision and which we hope will become a book on apologetics someday. And that summary should work to a certain degree in summarizing for you what I've been saying at this conference as well. In conclusion, let's remember the stirring words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 at the 20th verse. And make that the motto of what we do when we go out into the world, we go to college, wherever we may be. And we need to defend the faith. And we recognize we're dealing with somebody who's got an antithetical worldview a whole system of thought and philosophy which is co in principle contrary to what we believe as Christians. Paul said, where is the wise? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And when you take that approach to apologetics you have to end up where Paul ended up thanking God that in his own wisdom which the world considers foolish he was willing to save us by the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. The reason why we have hope in doing apologetics is because we know that God was powerful enough to save us, to change our minds, and to bring us into his kingdom, the kingdom of his dear son. And for that reason, our labor will not be in vain as we try to defend the faith with others. That the same God who drew you into his kingdom can draw others as well. Your job is not to change their hearts. Your job is simply to be faithful. Do your best to close the mouth of the unbeliever. Lay out a true, a pure, a faithful witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit will do the work of drawing people in. Thank you very much.